Good morning. So after church here, I'm in Fayetteville. Had to run over here to the park for a few minutes with some friends and Legacy is with me. He just ate an ice cream cone. And this person wants to turn in so I shall get out of their way. I typically always drive like I'm pulling a trailer with $100,000 worth of cattle in it because my dogs do not like to be knocked around in the back. <clears throat> so, Legacy, what you think? He must have dripped a drop. Dripped a drop, and he's going to get every last. Yummy, you have ice cream all over your face, you silly boy. He is such a love. So, I wanted to revisit, let me turn this air down because it's loud. I wanted to revisit the subject of falling in the ditch. But the other thing that God has just impressed on my heart today was, you can hear this, the greatest weapon we have as Christians is love. In fact, the scripture says, they, all men will know that you are my disciples not by your religion, not by your do's and don'ts, but by love, by the way you treat other people to their face and behind their back. Are you honoring and respecting? And I think the greatest challenge sometimes we as Christians face, and that is with our own family, our own soul wounds, our own. So if you think about this, which maybe I shouldn't, even go there but, but I will so everyone you meet gets an account if you think about this everyone you've ever met got an account now you've forgotten mo most of these but your own family I'm talking about family dynamics in within your own family and with a husband and wife I learned this principle from Dr. Harley he did two wonderful marriage books and I wish I could think of the name of them. I will in a minute. Anyway, he talks about these love banks or love tanks, right? So every interaction you do with someone, they're either putting money in or they're taking money out. So when you see a marriage that goes into divorce, trust me, both, typically, both spouses are in the red so far in the red you think that they would never come out now i've helped with a lot of marriage retreat and i needed a marriage retreats and i have needed a lot of help in my marriage and i can tell you that you can come out of the red and heal a marriage uh, but anyway i didn't really mean to talk about marriage today so i, I wanted to talk about our greatest weapon is love our greatest weapon is love and so two things that I wanted to talk about that is number one we have to love ourselves and I'm and give ourselves grace I'm not but I'm not saying greasy grace grace cost Christ his life so grace is precious valuable and expensive so I'm not saying it's okay to sit on the couch and never go to work. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying, love yourself enough to give yourself grace to take off that cloak of perfection. And so what I have seen, you know, that perfectionism is the law. No one can live under the law because no one can keep all the requirements of the law. And the scribes and the Pharisees certainly tried, and the only cloak they wore was self-righteousness. I keep the law, therefore I am righteous, and I'm going to get to heaven because of what I have done. And Ephesians 2 tells us that's not true. For it is by grace ye are saved, and this not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. When you get to heaven, they're not going to let you in because you did something good. The only way you get in is that your sins are covered by the blood of Jesus, his atoning blood on the cross is our finished work. The work on the cross is a finished work. It's the only way we get to heaven. We confess our sin and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That gets our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life 
and then I say keep your relationship with him current right so I'm not quite sure why I said all that so so love our greatest weapon is love how do we why would the world want to be part of a church that you come in you know Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees you search the whole world over to find one disciple and you make him twice the son of Satan that you are and self-righteousness will do that self-righteousness is and religion that's why God hates religion it separates you from God when you think that you're going to get to heaven because you've kept some rules and regulations you're wrong and when you teach other people that that is the only way to heaven you're incorrect too you're teaching them something that's incorrect and that self cloaking yourself in self-righteousness and I've been there you know when I taught Sunday school for almost 20 years and I thought I was somebody in this church and I didn't even realize that I was walking around with this horrible stinky self-righteousness that stunk in the nostrils of God that did not bring anyone so think about this when you go to church you, know, you put this mask on I'm perfect and I keep the law therefore I am righteous and don't you wish you were holy like me that's a mask no one no one keeps all of the law okay no one they tried and it failed in the Old Testament so you don't want to try to live Paul says don't try to live under the letter of the law I don't know if you remember this in the New Testament where at the beginning all the converts were actually Jewish people and so when the Gentiles began to come in uh, some of them were uh, Peter was having them be circumcised as an adult which is a really traumatic thing uh, so he was saying Paul was saying don't do that they do not have to live under the law or live up to the law okay it is by grace we are saved not of works lest any man should boast so it is the grace of God so again I don't know why I, I went there but just to say that self-righteousness is not going to bring anybody to the cross your righteousness now it does say do good works so that other people will see them and glorify God in heaven and we all are all about doing something with the right motive but that doesn't make us righteous only the blood of Jesus makes us righteous so kind of wanted to revisit this whole thing about being in the ditch because I had started a thought and didn't finish it and that was a good example of someone so we're driving our car of life down this road and we get up and we're having a happy day and I have heard this several times and someone say one thing happened and then they had an awful day well let me tell you someone stepped on one of your soul wounds and the enemy wants to knock your car of life in the ditch and he will use our wounded souls to do so just like me driving through the wrong window at the bank the other day and the lady informed me that this was the commercial window and I needed to use the other windows because I simply was not qualified to use that window and it, and it really did it kind of made me mad anyway but I got over it so think about someone that's got a ship on their shoulder they have a bad attitude or they're um, they're angry think about an angry person they're struggling not to be angry they're struggling they're struggling and of course I understand this is can be can be several things patterns ditches um, demonic oppression offense Ooh, let's talk about offense someone that's angry well you just look at them wrong and you have offended them right and I have met people that actually carried this spirit of offense it doesn't matter what you did you offended them um, it, you know there is no being friends with someone like that because there's no grace there's no uh, there is no operation of the gifts of the spirit remember the fruits of love are what joy peace patience goodness kindness 
uh, faithfulness. So there's none of that. So I just think about, uh, and I married an angry person, a very angry person. When he was wonderful, he was wonderful, but when he was angry, he was wretched. I mean, anyway, I had holes in my walls and TVs thrown through windows. And so this was quite this, we'll be married 40 years this summer. This was quite this process of, of uh, him maturing to be able to put that down, put that under, because any little thing. So this was very interesting too when I came in to his family and his aunts and uncles. I remember one time when Rachel was little, she was about two or three years old, and she was just, well, I guess she was about two, because she was walk, trying to walk real good, and um, she hit her head on the coffee table, and his aunt hits the coffee table, literally, and says, bad coffee table. I'm like, lady, the coffee table didn't move. The coffee table is an inanimate object. It did not move. It did not jump up and hit my daughter. My daughter hit the coffee table. So that teaching them to be angry and to lash out and to not take any responsibility for your actions. But I remember when Tim and I was first married, he's carrying this box in the house. In some way, the box, you know, had clothes at the top, came up and was scratching him, or I don't know if it cut him. I mean, he was flew into the box. He flew into the box and ripped it into shreds. <laughs> I was like, ooh, I married an angry man. So, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time. We had some crazy years, okay? Crazy. I would never repeat those years. And he has worked very hard to not fall in the ditch. It's, you know, these demons want to just push you in this ditch. I'm angry and I'm going to react and lash out. And so here's another ditch that I notice that people fall into. If you stump your toe, you curse. You curse your life. You curse your circumstances. So just think about walking through life. If something happens that you don't like, something, somebody pulled out in front of you in traffic, something didn't come to pass that you wanted to come to pass, you tried to open a door and it wouldn't open. And the first thing that comes up is cursing. Well, what the enemy is getting you to do is curse your own life. You are, when you do that, we're not living in submission to God and what is coming out of our mouth is being used against us. And so, boy, Jesus said, I think this is Matthew 12, 26 or 20, I mean 36, 36, we will give an account for every idle word we speak. Every word. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. It's very important what comes out of our mouth. So the enemy tempts us to to speak curses or what to speak, and usually it's profanity or even using God's name in vain. I knew a person that would do that. I mean, this person would just use God's name in vain, and I'm like, God loves you. In the Ten Commandments. The first commandment, I think the second commandment is, the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other God before me. And the second commandment is, Thou shalt not use the Lord thy God's name in vain. So it is a serious thing to just walk around and, and every time something doesn't go your way, and the enemy tempts you to fall into the ditch, the ditch of cursing your life. Because you think that you may be cursing your circumstances, but you're not. You're, those curses come back on you. And when you damn God, you're actually bringing a curse upon yourself. So that, so you wonder why your life is in the toilet? It's the words of our mouth, people. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. So. I just felt like revisiting 
that because trust me, I have spent many, many of parts of my years in the ditch. And it is work to get out. And so how do we get out of the ditch? Let's talk about that because that's important. Number one, repentance. God, I'm sorry for whatever, you know. Please forgive me for having a bad attitude, not seeing things correctly, refusing to praise you, refusing to be grateful. So repentance and repentance is, um, it's not flippant. It's not, it's genuine. It's not repentance unless it's genuine. Not, I'm sorry I got caught, but I'm sorry I did something that hurt you, Father. I'm sorry. So repentance, then once we apply the blood of Jesus, then we can apply the deutimous power of Jesus because when he raised from the dead, he said all power was given unto him. All power. Remember, I think this is Philippians 4 where it says, at the name of Jesus, everything on earth, everything in the heavenlies, and everything under the earth will bow its knee, and everything's tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I think it's Philippians 2. I apologize. But just read all of Philippians. It's wonderful, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's Philippians 4. So, so how do we get out of the ditch? The atoning work of Jesus on the cross. The blood of Jesus. Then apply that power, that deutimous power that God exerted in Jesus Christ. This is Romans 8. When he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that power lives in us. And that power keeps us on the road and out of the ditch. On the road with purpose, uh, moving forward to where God wants us to be. And where is that? Just not to bring him, our purpose is to bring him glory. So making our divine connections and even in our family. So I don't know why I keep thinking about this. Maybe because when I had children at home, this was this huge thing because go back to my children had stabbed their tanks until they were empty by the time they were teenagers. I mean, I loved them, but I did not like them because they would fuss and fight. And Oh my goodness. I was like, I went away from you too. And I understand now looking back that their daddy and I gave them no good tools to resolve conflict. All they saw was strife and war and so that's what they did too and I'm like I don't like this. I don't like this a bit. So one thing that my husband and I have definitely done is take authority over the spirit of strife because if you knew his family of origin and my family of origin, both strife rule supreme that it, I, I remember being around his mom and dad when they milked cows. They had this dog named Tiger and he would, they would get into it. So, you know, in a marriage, sometimes you have a big blow up maybe once a year or once every other year and things get out of hand and things get really ugly and it's not what you wanted. No, no. Every day, every day they were screaming and cursing and throwing things and threatening to kill one another. I'm talking serious to the point of death. They would fight. And their dog would cry and he would cover his eyes with his paws. So when I would be with them, because I helped them milk when I first came into the family, I would just wait for it. Like they could like hold it off sometimes. Not it didn't happen in the morning. Sometimes it was even in the afternoon. We milked at three thirty in the morning, three thirty in the afternoon. But boy, it, typically there was not a day that went by that they did not get into it. I'm talking wretched, and that was where my husband was raised. And my husband, and I'm not saying that my now my stepmom wouldn't fight with my dad, but my real mom would. 
So until I was six years old, I saw that con this conflict and no good tools to resolve conflict. And so my stepmom would not, she would not get in my dad's face and fight with him. She did other things, you know, she was kind of passive, aggressive that way. She just, anyway, I, I, she's been gone since 2013. God rest her soul, I know she's in heaven. And I love my stepmom, and um, I'm just saying, she didn't give me any good tools either about resolving conflict. She just ignored it. That's what she did. She just ignored it like that. Peace at any cost will trust me, it cost her her life. Um, so, that, so coming into a marriage, doing all these wonderful marriage retreats with Gary Smalley and I mean I can't even think of all the wonderful marriage retru retreats we have done that helped us gain tools and see other people were actually doing this marriage thing and they liked each other you know I didn't know you could like your spouse because trust me love had left us a long time <laughs> you do enough injury to one another there is no love left so think about Dr. Harley's what was the name of that book? I cannot believe it. His Needs, Her Needs. That was his first book. And then his second book, which he said he should have written first, was Love Busters. And two great marriage resources. Fabulous books. So if you, I should just reread them because they're fabulous resources, right? But even having good tools, we need to take spiritual authority over things that are coming against us. And do not think that the enemy wants you to be happily married, love your spouse, adore your children, teach them good tools. That's not true. So we have to put on the full armor of God and we have to wage war. I don't care whether you want to be in a war or not. You're in a war. If you're a Christian, you're part of the army, okay? And the enemy is assaulting you whether you like it or not. So, our defense is our armor, Ephesians 6, and the Word of God. So, and that is part of your armor. So, in Ephesians 6, it says that we can put on our helmet of salvation to protect our thoughts, a breastplate of righteousness, so don't be going around doing things that are not right. Our, we guard our loins with truth. I often say, God, show me anywhere I'm believing a lie. We shed our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace that let us walk in peace. That's powerful. Nobody wants to hear the gospel from you if you're going to be in strife and be fighting with people. That's not attractive. That's not lovely, and that's not Jesus. So then our sword of the Spirit and our shield of faith. Our sword of the spirit is the word of God and our shield of faith. Hallelujah. And the scripture says, wherewith we will quench every fiery dart of the enemy. Don't think that the enemy doesn't have um, fiery darts that he tries to make us think things that are not, um, that, that are a lie. You're not good enough, you're not worthy. You don't deserve love. And the enemy isolates. And when the enemy begin, begins to isolate you, you be, begin to believe these lies. So put on your armor and praise God. One of our greatest weapons, and let's say is love, is also worship and praise. Okay? Because you cannot praise God and be depressed. You can't. You can't praise God and be angry <laughs> you get all this washed away you know you can't be mad at people that have done you wrong I and I look at our precious little pastor and he said this this morning and it hurts me when but look at Paul the apostle he was shipwrecked he was they kept trying to kill him one time they stoned him people don't realize they stoned him to death back then they didn't just throw a little rock at you they stoned him to death. God raised him from the dead, healed him, and he walked 30 miles to the next city to keep preaching because God wasn't done with him. They drug him outside the city and left him. So actually the pastor said that this morning and he said, and they thought they'd killed him. No, honey, they did kill him. They didn't think nothing. If you get stoned, you're dead. There is no record of someone that was stoned that didn't die. 
they were very good. It's like, well, I hung him, but he didn't die. If you get hung, you're dead. Um, and our pastor was just saying that people had done him wrong, and and not not. And he was just saying, and then you get back up and you love people, right? And that's what I love about our pastor. I get back up and I love people. People have said bad things about him. People have cheated him. People have stomped on his feelings. People have not appreciated him. Um, and so that just makes me appreciate him all that much more. And he's just an amazing man of God and transparent and tender-hearted and loves his beautiful wife and his kids. And um, I just think the world of our little pastor and our church. So he was my daughter's youth pastor years ago. I told her yesterday, I said, honey, it's almost your 20th um, class reunion in two years. She goes, no, mom. Nah, 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 nah. I don't want to hear it. I'm like, it's true. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I've got a bucket in the back. Let me pray for you. Lord, you are so good and so good to us. I just speak a blessing over anyone who's still with me 26 minutes in. Thank you that you, that the blood of Jesus covers and makes us the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in me and it quickens my mortal body and it, and it makes me alive. It makes me happy. I get happy when I think about what the Lord has done for me. Thank you, Lord. I pray for people, God, that we would stay up on this road of life and that we would stay out of the ditches because we're not bringing you glory or honor while we're in the ditch. So I just pray you would anoint our thoughts and our attitudes and that we would bring you glory. We choose to bring you glory, our purpose, in the name of Jesus.